Message and data rates may apply. When did it become okay for men to be lazier, softer, fatter? We need to bring the men of this country back to greatness. And it's easier than ever with Ageless Male Max, a patent-pending formula with an ingredient that helps boost your total testosterone, promoting greater increases in muscle size and twice the reduction of body fat percentage than exercise alone. Plus, an amazing 64% increase in nitric oxide, which can be handy in the gym and in the bedroom. Take your manhood to the max by trying your first 30-day bottle free. Just pay shipping and handling. Not 10 days, not 15 days, but a full 30-day supply free. When you text the word LIFT to 797979. Finally, a formula that boosts total testosterone. If your results with Ageless Male Max are too intense, please decrease use. For your free bottle, text LIFT to 797979. Text L-I-F-T to 797979. Tim Kalisha, Sarah Spain, Clinton Yates, Bob Ryan, where have you been all my life? Let's go! Vegas! Can you ah, still yeah. say Vegas if everybody's Vegas now and everybody's betting? <laughs> There's more money on the Rams going into the season than any other team. What do we think of that call? And also the night in superhuman performances from Nadal, Deladon, and Sue Bird. Let's go around the horn. Hey. The was on fire. I only go to Vegas to watch Capitals championship wins. It's so Around the Horn, the show of competitive banter. Here's Tony Rielli. You know, football is the ultimate team sport. One person doesn't make or break it. So, um, you know, I'd, I'd like to say that, that the linemen are more, more important than any skill position player, including myself, on this on this team. So, um, you know, we're more than just often more than just one guy. Rob Desperger also told NFL Network's Aditi King of Walla that the holdout isn't bothering him, but might be bothering other guys on the team. Meanwhile, Bell's agent said he's going to do the things to protect him long term and is still expecting to have his best season. Sarah, how do you hear all that? Well, I would say that Ben Roethlisberger is giving us what is expected at this point. You know, we're so much bigger than just one guy. But I think it's of note that he mentioned the offensive line as the most important. As if to say, whoever's running behind that is going to be just great. It doesn't matter whether you're Le'Veon Bell or not. I don't know if that was shade. But I do know that hearing the possibility that Bell might not be back till week 10, because that is the latest he can show up for this team and still be eligible for free agency after the season ends, is absolutely insane. You expected this holdout to probably end today. The idea that he would be willing to get rid of an almost an entire season to, to show the Steelers or anybody else that he believes he's worth more than what he's getting would be beyond extreme. I, I almost can't imagine. I think that would be beyond extreme because, I mean, there are examples in history. I mean, Smith didn't play the first two games of a season, right, Tim Kalishaw? Let's bring in Tim Kalishaw here. Let's Talk to us in. about Emmett Smith's holdout, maybe historically, and what you're hearing from Pittsburgh today. The difference is Emmett uh, at that time, uh, the rules were very different in 1993, and th- th- you could negotiate into the season, and he did get more money by waiting those two games. Levy and Bell's contract is set for this year. There's nothing the Steelers can do about it. Uh, Sarah referenced the 10 games. Vincent Jackson did that a number of years ago with the Chargers, sat out as long as you could, and then you show up for those last six games, and you get the year's credit to become a free agent. Yeah. I just... If that's Le'Veon Bell's strategy, I just think it's a terrible strategy. I don't know the teams are going to fall all over themselves for a running back uh, on a second contract six years into his NFL career, no matter how good he is. Really? Clint Yates, how about you? I agree with Tim entirely. And the other problem here is that his agent negotiating this in the media isn't helping his cause either. Mike Tomlin got on stage and basically said, I haven't thought of this one bit. We'll determine what happens when he gets back and we'll figure it out from the time that he's practicing, from the time that he's going to play a game, which means to me that Tomlin has basically moved on in some way as much as he can from what Le'Veon Bell can provide. So if I'm Tom, excuse me, if I'm Bell's agent, I'm just sitting back on this and doing it in the shadows because you're not going to win any sort of public opinion battle against the Steelers. They're an NFL franchise. Franchise and you're one dude who plays running back no matter what percentage of the touches you get from that offense. Okay, that's that's three who are kind of unanimous here. Let's see if it is unanimous. Bob Ryan, please. 
Let's start with the Big Ben and his assertion that no, oh, no one player is, uh, makes a team. Well, maybe not one, but how about three? How about the fact that when he and Antonio Brown and, and Bell play, they're 41 and 19 since 2013, and when one of them, only one of them is missing, they're 15 and 12. I realize that sometimes there's schedule it's in there, but I think that tells us what we need to know. Secondly, so it's a lot of BS, okay, Ben? Secondly, when he's done playing, I suspect he's going to enter the Fletcher School of Diplomacy over here in Medford, Massachusetts at Tufts, because what he's doing with the linemen, Sarah, it's not, he's buttering those guys up. That's his bread and butter. They're protecting okay. him. Okay. That's what he's doing there. That's Believe from the Roethlisberger perspective. He can't possibly mean what he said. Believe me. I hear it's you. Not that I, I hear you there. And, and maybe I'm even inclined to, to agree with you, or maybe you swayed me there, Bob. But can you, can you approach it from Bell's perspective here, all right? Yeah. Coming up on a free agency year, you know, uh, he certainly thinks he's the best running back in the NFL, and he's got good reason to, to think that. And... Maybe he doesn't play the first week of the season or the first four weeks of the season. Maybe he's healthier for the long term and for his next contract. Would that be so bad from his perspective, Bob? You want to address that real In quick? In theory, uh, it depends on how you know, this would be telling the world what a team guy he is or isn't. Yes, in his own selfish manner to, for, to preserve the possibility of getting that big contract if he sets out X games right up to 10. Mm-hmm. Sure. But right, okay. by the way, what message are you sending to the world about what you are as far as the team is concerned? Teammate is concerned. And I think that would be an equal concern. So you would call that selfish then? If Le'Veon Bell yes. looks out for his own best interest in his career, you would call that selfish. Callis, do you on agree a with team, that? I think the Steelers' problem is. Bell saw Todd Gurley's guaranteed money this summer. Worse, he saw Saquon Barkley's guaranteed money, who hasn't played it down yet. And he said, why am I sitting here on one-year deals? Why is this team doing this to me? Now, they can't change it now, but that, that's still got to be in his head. And last word, Sarah Spain. Yeah, of course, you want to say, guys, do whatever you want. It's a business. There's no loyalty from the teams. But you still play a team sport. So if you're in a position where you're considering leaving your team high and dry through week 10 because you want to get a better contract going forward, not only are you screwing over all of your teammates, all of your fans, all of the people that have been rooting for you and paying your salary for the last few years, but you're also then setting yourself up to go into free agency and saying, not only do I want the kind of money no one else is getting, but you should believe that I'll be there for you, even even though I wasn't there for my last team. All right, I hear you guys loud and clear. I look forward to your next negotiations with this network as well. I mean, we're all a team. We're all going to uh, take Never a... about just one talent. It's, <laughs> it's always about the team. We'll move on. Let's, let's, go, let's go back to Vegas. Let's put those numbers ah. on. I know these are Harry Benedict's casinos, but Patriots favorites at 6-1. to one. Then the Steelers, Rams, and Vikings. Eagles have the eighth best odds going into the year. And the most money has been put on the Rams. Packers, Vikings, Niners also getting heavy play. That's a whole lot to download there, Tim Callis. Show we go to you as a resident handicapper. What's right there and what smells off? Well, I mean, the, the Rams is an interesting one. They're, they're, they're a great mystery because they didn't do anything in the preseason. We haven't seen Golf and Gurley and all those guys at all. Now, in your Dallas Morning News, which hopefully will be landing in your front yards tomorrow, uh, you'll see all of our predictions. <laughs> I have the, I can't give it all away. Let me put it this way. It's I in my front Rams yard right now, Bowl. Tim Gallishaw. This is how I'm getting it right here. Too. Thank you. Yeah. I have the Rams in the Super Bowl. I do not have them winning the city championship. That's all I'm going to tell you on that. Oh. But I think whoa, the Rams, whoa, 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 whoa. But I think the Rams are, are a very interesting bet. I think the Eagles are being too much ignored. I think people are so worried about Wentz that they're forgetting that he will be back soon and he'll probably be okay mm-hmm. and he'll be motivated and that's a very good team. And, I, and so they should be getting much higher in the betting window. All right, so you, you think, you think Philly is undervalued right now as a defending champ. I just want to write this down. You've got, you've got the Chargers over the Rams in the Super Bowl. That's what you just told Well, that's, what it, like. that's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like, I'm saying. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Uh, Bob Ryan, were you just checking the, the, the paper right there to see what the picks were? Go ahead. Tim, pay no attention to that child host of this program. This is how I will get my information. Well, you're reading a New York paper, not even Boston. I'm just just giving as an example of the genre. I am am aware of the industry. I read six of them daily. Now, as far as these odds are concerned, you have to remember what odds are and what the purpose of people betting is to try to make money and to maximize their return. And and they see the Rams as having a chance, a decent chance in their mind. I don't see it, frankly. I don't see the Rams as having any kind of a ghost of a chance to borrow an old popular song. No. I know people are popular, maybe because Aaron Donald's in their brain. He just signed a big contract. I don't know what's going on there, but I don't see the Rams as being the case at all. Glenn Yates, how about you? 
The Rams were good last year, and the Rams got better in the offseason. Forget the preseason. I'm not sure what I'm not understanding here. They're a very good football team, but the thing that stood out to me most here is the Niners getting all this money. They were not good last year, and they've got this Jimmy G situation, which nobody's going to figure out. I don't know why anybody would think that team is something going to bust out of the West. Wait, but I don't you understand say they've got this... Jimmy G situation, you say that like it's a bad thing, a negative thing. What's the Jimmy G situation? We don't know what that's going to turn out to be like in in regards to his, you know, sinking with Kyle Shanahan over the course of a full season, in my opinion. I'm not saying it's necessarily going to be bad. I just Mm -hmm. wouldn't have any money on it in Vegas. Sarah Spain, how about you? Yeah, if you guys want to wait for the newspaper tomorrow, you could do that. Or you could just pull out your phone and yeah. find the ESPN app and listen to Spain and Fitz tonight. And, oh, and then you'll get okay. all of our predictions. This is about you? Uh, wait a second. Uh, uh, well, you know, if we're self-promoting here. But I wouldn't recommend it because I know nothing about gambling. The most gambling I've done is <laughs> squares for a Super Bowl. But I will say this yeah. much. I feel like I'm surprised that the Eagles are getting as little action as they are. I know it's tough to repeat. And I know maybe their fans are still out somewhere drinking and haven't gotten around to placing their bets yet. But they're getting back Carson Wentz. They're, they essentially become a team that's got a guy at quarterback who's more talented than the one that won it for them and is hungry because he didn't get to participate in that Super Bowl. I don't expect him to be top, but I'm surprised that they are not getting as much love as I would think. Good call, shout out to the horn. The safest bet on the board remains the most boring bet on the board. It's the New England Patriots at 6-1 to one in a division they've already won by four games, so you know they can be playing at home <laughs> in the playoffs. Just nobody wants to entertain that thought. All right, we'll <laughs> move on. Tennis. Nadal surviving team last night. Look at this line. Love 6, 6-4, six, 7-5, seven, 6-7 seven with a 4-7 tiebreak. 7-6 seven, with a 7-5 tiebreak. 4 hours and 49 minutes. Another marathon for Rafael Nadal. Tim, what does it mean? What does this one mean specifically? First of all, thanks to the U.S. Open for being the only major that has a tiebreak in the fifth set. So we knew there would be an ending to this match at, if I'm you call you. it 2 o'clock, a reasonable time but it means a lot i mean nadal wins these four and five hour matches he's only three grand slams behind federer he's five years younger roger federer fans want to think the 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 argument is over on the on the greatest of all time it is not Uh, rafa nadal has shown he's all the way back uh health wise and uh he's got a great chance to to get number 18 this sunday sarah speed I mean, I think I agree with you that there's plenty of time for Rafa to catch up to Federer and pass him. And those people who are pr- prefer Federer are going to have to eventually let the numbers tell them that maybe the story is different than the way they read it. I think this match in particular is a great one to look at and say you're down, you, you went... 6-0 in the first one, everybody thinks you're out, and then you fight your way back in. It's a great storytelling match, but he hasn't won that major. It doesn't get him closer to that Federer mark in this moment. So I, I just think it's great. It's wonderful. We're going to be talking about it. It doesn't necessarily change how I feel about their legacy yet. Tim, I guess you were on deadline for that column out there in New York to get in the newspaper that night. <laughs> yeah. But what it shows to me is that Nadal is probably going to outlast Federer in terms of the battle between the two of them being greatest, which I think is something ultimately is good for men's tennis. Those two of them were the biggest story in the world as far as, you know, staying away from the women's side of the draw for those of us who are more casual tennis fans. But I like this. I like seeing Nadal, especially when the last time you saw Roger on the court, he was basically saying, I want the match to be over with and bowing right. out. Seeing Nadal being able to battle and hang around, I think it's a good thing overall. And Bob Ryan. I think you're all burying the lead. The lead to me is very simply this, that the man is trying to show the world that he is not merely a creature of clay. A disproportionate percentage of his majors, as more than any great player on any previous surface, True. As, as, uh, are in the, with French Open alone on clay. He's the master, he's the greatest clay player of all time. That's beyond dispute. We all know that. He has to show the world, not just with the accumulation of number, but just by winning on these other surfaces. That's what he's got to do. He and has one on the other doing. surfaces. So I know he has one, but he needs mean, to win more. And more. And it's been his years with per- Federer has This proportion is enormous. I, I hear you, Bob. And, and Tim, last question on this, because you brought it up first. Um, Federer has the, the final number right now. Nadal could pass him. There's that other number about the head-to-head. Majority have been played on clay, but it's in Nadal's favor as well. It's 23-15. How will history view that? Well, yeah. one thing to remember on that, on the Federer side, is that they, a lot of those matches are uh, were originally at the French Open, and there's a lot of finals and uh, semifinals early in the career, Nadal didn't get to. So when Roger was younger, he didn't play Nadal. Sarah, did you want to answer that as well? Yeah, I was just going to say, I completely agree with that. I think that the issue is whether once you've decided which style or person you like, you're going to twist whichever stats you need to give you what you're looking for. The head-to-head might be the most appropriate you're one. You're trying to twist some stats right now, those nine points? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of behind, so I might yeah, need to. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens in buyer's sell. Stick around. Stay 
State Farm. This is Bill. It finally got me, Bill. What's that, Rick? The Clark Street Crater, the mother of all potholes. Oh. Yeah, year after rim-wrecking year, it's tormented the people of this town. They try to fill it, but it always returns. It got me good. But you know, State Farm's got you, too. You hear that? You ain't nothing! You trash-talking a pothole? Yes. Yes, I am. Go with the one that's here to help life go right. State Farm. Talk to an agent today. We got ourselves a finals. Mystics and Storm. How we got here. Della Dunn on one leg, double doubling out the wazoo to beat the dream. And super, superhuman. The four threes over the last six minutes to beat the Mercury. The net doesn't even move on her last one. Who had the better performance in the biggest spot, Tim Caldershaw? I think you have to go with Sue Bird, the oldest player in the WNBA. And as you said, 14 points in the final six minutes brought her team from uh, from behind to go into the finals. Give it to her. Sarah Spain. Yeah, absolutely. She's logged the most minutes, the most games in WNBA history. She was on a rebuilding team, thought she'd never make the finals again. It looks like they're going to be bounced, and she just goes out and gets nuts. Absolutely insane. Uh, unconscious shooting from near the half court line. It's got to be Sue Bird. Lynn Yates. Yeah, but Sue Bird's been there before. The sticks have not. And Atlanta Dada Don to come back from that injury and actually play to get them to the finals for the first time in that franchise's history. The last WNBA team to ever make the finals. For me, that's the big story. Bob Ryan. Brianna Stewart may very well turn out to be the greatest of all the UConn players, but this is about Sue Bird's performance last night. The greatest point guard in the Dawn St- post Dawn Staley era of women's basketball. Mm-hmm. Sue Bird. And to do it, she had to beat Deanna Taurasi and the other greats from UConn. We'll move on. Buy or sell two. The top grades for catcher Monday night. I want you guys to look at this because Steve Gelbs of SNY is reporting it wasn't a catch. Frazier picked up a ball, a rubber ball that they're pointing to right there, that he found while landing and rolling around in the front row, showed it to the ump, and got an out call. Do you believe that? And if so, did Frazier do something sneaky bad or sneaky good, Sarah? I absolutely buy it. I know there are people who are going to say that they want the fan who had the rubber ball to come forward, but I think that reporter doesn't tell us he knows it's a rubber ball unless he saw it and heard it, and I'm looking at the way he threw that right back into the stands real quick before anyone could notice it didn't have any seams on it, looked a little bit smaller than regulation, and I disagree with the idea if you ain't cheating, you ain't trying. I think if you ain't, if you are cheating, you're not good enough to do it right. Okay, so you think it is sneaky bad to be doing it, sneaky but you bad. believe he did do it. Clint, how about you? This is excellent work from Todd Frazier. Are you kidding me? If you've got a side ball that just appears and you manage to find a way to get it out and get out of an inning and fool an umpire as well, it could not be better. I love this all the way, even if I don't necessarily believe the reporting proves it. If it worked, it was a good thing. Bob Ron. This is the equivalent of flopping. It's fine with me. Fine with me. I'm agreeing with Clinton on this one. The fact is that historically there have been many times guys have disappeared into the stands and people will never know whether or not they actually really did catch the ball or not. Okay? This is only the latest. I give him full credit for pulling this off if he did. I also have to go sneaky good. The other thing to remember, he plays for the New York Mets. It's been a long, long season. He's trying to make something good happen for that team. You can see how proud he was in the dugout. He's telling him, he's telling his teammates what he pulled off over there. Although I'm not he sure the video, out. that that arrow pointing at a ball. Okay, right. there's another ball there. We'll, we'll, we'll allow for that. Whether he dropped or not, I never saw it on video, so I don't know. We'll move on. Buy yourself. You're all cheaters. Did Virginia Tech? Fake injuries to slow down Florida State, like Florida State coach Willie Taggart insinuates. And if so, is that wrong? But even more if so, where do you come down on Willie Taggart saying that after his team laid the egg they did at home in the decked out jerseys in his debut, Clinton? Listen, Willie Taggart, if you get banged out at home by the Hokies in which you don't even get a touchdown on the board, it's probably in your best interest to lay low. I don't think that faking injuries did anything to do for, you know, you all fumbling the ball on your own five or you all not being able to get anything else done on offense. Taggart, you've got the black jerseys out and you sold out. Come on, guy. Stand back. If my team looked for most of the game as if it had just met 15 minutes before the game started and I played a game like that I don't care what was going on I would be doing this I'd be apologizing to Bobby Bowden Lee Corso and Burt Reynolds and saying okay I'll okay. see you next week Tim Gallisha. I will say if Willie Taggart can successfully deflect the conversation another way he should do that they also should make the rule tougher on these defenses make the guys sit out three plays four plays uh, it does happen and they were doing okay, it okay alright 
But you say if he can deflect the conversation. Clearly, he didn't deflect the conversation if I'm listening to Clinton well, and Bob's first answer. Right, Sarah Spain, how about you? It for me. Yeah, I'm buying that this probably <laughs> did happen. And I'm buying that the team's frustrated by it. But I'm completely selling Willie Taggart bringing this up because what's the end goal here? What do you gain from this? It doesn't get you back that win. It doesn't change people's perception of you after that loss. So all you're doing is now doubling down on your loss by looking like someone who's searching for excuses. Not a great approach. That's something you would never do, Sarah. You know you're getting a bolt here. But I do want to say this far more important. Public service announcement. Your piece on KC Chiefs assistant coach Dylan McCullough on ESPN.com and E60 Report. Phenomenal work. My jaw dropped when I was reading it. And I think it's just a glorious demonstration of how somebody's search for their own identity can take them far and wide, but sometimes right back where they always wished it would be and knew it would be. So I, I can't thank, thank you enough for that. And I really think you should take this and write a book on it, do a TV series on it, go as big as you can with it because it's amazing. All right, I'm on it. Also, Tim Callis show was on the show today. Clint Yates, Bob Ryan, showdown next. <laughs> AARP can help you become your healthiest self. It's why we offer health tips for your body and your brain. So take on today and every day with AARP. Learn how at takeontoday.aarp. Ryder Cup, Captain's Picks, Tim Furyk going Tiger, Phil, and DeChambeau. Clinton, I go to you for my Ryder Cup jingoism. Furyk, get this right. Who are you buying is the best pick? I'm buying Tiger simply because this is a manner in which a lot of people aren't used to seeing him, and I think this is going to be something that gets him back into the good graces of a lot of golf fans from a USA standpoint. I like that. Also, Tony Finau coming up on Monday. Happy about that. I'm going to go with the kid for the simple reason that Tiger and Phil are combined 31, 37, and 10 lifetime in Ryder Cup Ooh. competition. They both have been totally underwhelming their entire Ooh. Ryder Cup careers. So with the, the kid can't be worse. Let's go with the kid. Woo! That's a two-point answer from Bob Ryan for Deshambu. We'll move on. Showdown 2. NHL considering banning keg stands with the Stanley Cup. Bob, I go to you for my keg standing. How do you rule? Well, the people that govern the Stanley Cup have seen it suffer all kinds of abuse, and they know what it can and can't take, and they think that this one may be over the top. I'm going to go with their judgment that keg standing is dangerous to the health of the cup. I'm sorry. If you want them not to break the Stanley Cup when they win with it, build a better cup. These are NHL oh, hockey God. players. What build are we talking about cup. here? They're partying with it all over the place. You can make it stronger. It's 2018. We have medals that can stand up to grown men, you know, doing keg stands on it. What are we build doing? Build a better cup. The whole point about the cup is the cup is the cup from the last 150 years. But Clinton Yates, this is going to kill your clutch points. Bob Ryan, face time. The uh, Basketball Hall of Fame inductions will take place in Springfield, Mass. on Friday evening, and one of the inductees will be Ray Allen of several teams, including the Boston Celtics. A person who's not happy with about the fact that Ray Allen is going in without the presence of his teammates in Boston, uh, namely Kevin Garnett, Rajon Rondo, and Paul Pierce, is Doc R Rivers, who coached him. Doc is like a papa, proud papa. He loved this team. He says it's his favorite team ever. And he wants kumbaya, and he's not going to have it. He's, his kids are, fat, are, are are warring. This is really bothering Doc. He's very emotional about this. I'm begging those guys. Come on, make, make your daddy happy. Come on, Doc. Come on, Kevin. Come on, Rajan. Come on. Paul. What is it, get though? I mean, it's just guys who don't get rain. along, right? It, it, I mean, Ubuntu <laughs> ain't Bury walking through that door, right? Come on. Uh, the 23 and a half hour die. break. We'll see you tomorrow. Get the Dallas Morning News, people. There's nothing small about your business. It takes a lot of hard work, and it makes a huge difference as a thank you. During Dell's annual sale, Dell Small Business is offering up to 40% off select PCs with Intel Core processors. Call them at 877-BY-DELL to speak with a small business technology advisor today. You'll get tech advice and one-on-one -on -one partnership to help your business grow. Give them a call. 877 by Dell.